So, Jake, listen, man. You have a fascinating history in, in radio. Forget everything else. I don't want to talk about your engineering. Just in radio. How did you start in radio? How old were you? What, what was going on? How did that start? So, I have to start, I think around eight, I kind of like got realization that my, my old man was a radio repair guy. And whoa, 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 eight, like eight years old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, that's when I started to like understand what my father did in the army, you know, mm. and he, I, and he was a radio repair guy. I, I probably would have understood, learned that earlier, but when I always saw him trying to fix stuff, he always led with a hammer. So I was like, all right, this is either, a, this is either army training and, and, and uh, action or, you know, he, he faked his way through things. But um, nonetheless, I, I started learning to solder and, and all that stuff, how to use a voltmeter, and he told me the basics back then. Mm-hmm. Um Maybe by 11 or 12, I was already building synthesizers and shortwave radios. So I had this, you know, I was building stuff early on. Mm. And then I befriended a guy in um, uh, in my hometown of Windsor that... Um, w- w- in, Windsor, Connecticut? Windsor, Connecticut, okay. yep. Yeah, and, um, and we had... He, I think he was a chief engineer at five different stations, and one of them was WKND, who was a quote-unquote black station mm. in the, you know... So, and it was about five minutes from my house. Mm-hmm. And so I was about 13 at that point, and he, um, he lived pretty far away. I think he, he lived near Rhode Island or something. And he's like, hey, you don't mind it. I mean, I, you know how to change fuses. You know how to, like, troubleshoot stuff. If, if we have any problems over there, can you come over and, and fix it? So I'm like, yeah, no problem. So I think I got my first paychecks when I was 13 as a no, it's Wasn't that it the whole way to hold on a second? Isn't that illegal? You could that's yeah, child true, labor. Man, What's going man. on here? <laughs> yeah, I think I had to pay rent by then. My old man was pretty rough, you know. So you're old enough to, you know, <laughs> old enough to get a paycheck. <laughs> you have to pay me. <laughs> so we ended up. I think one of my favorite stories is uh, I had two. My first radio remote was for the Shad Derby. Shad are these fish that go up the Connecticut River, mm-hmm. and. Um, they had a fish queen, and the you know, the whole town had this like little uh, con- fishing contest and all that. Stuff. This was in still in your town, Windsor. In Windsor, Windsor yeah. Okay, okay. And so we had um, you know, we covered the remote, and it was you know Marty remote, meaning a wireless. Uh, I think it was four hundred fifty five megahertz uh, stu- the studio transmitter link, and we covered the remote, and that was officially my first remote. And about two weeks after that. They asked me, hey, you want to go do another remote? And I was like, yeah, sure, that was cool. This was a little more challenging. It was further away. It was you, you were still 13 at the time? Yeah, mm-hmm. summer of 75. And I went up to, I want to say Ellington or Enfield. It was basically the only high-security high, uh, prison in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And we did a remote from there. And again, you know, this is a quote-unquote black station back then. Well, and, well, well, hold on a second. Why were you at the prison? Because we were interviewing uh, prisoners. Oh. And I brought, I, I remember bringing like a crate and a milk cart, uh, milk crate, a bunch of uh, 12 inch uh, singles, mm-hmm. you know, uh, bringing them up there to give away. And it was like some kind of, I, I don't know if in particular we, we were going after one particular person. Like, uh, I don't think so. I think it was just like, go interview a bunch of the, the state of the prison situation, right? Mm-hmm. But I remember here, I'm 13 years old, just carrying a crate of records, mm-hmm. and I hear some guy, like, far away, like, come interview me, man. I'll tell you how it is. I'll show you what's going on, you know, and they're screaming and stuff. And, and, and you know, I'm, like, shaking. I'm like, oh, man, what am I doing here? You know? <laughs> and I'm like, and, and the guards are finally like, hey, man, don't worry about that guy. He, like, killed his entire family. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I won't worry about that guy. So, <laughs> but better God. story is, like, so I, back then I'm riding my, my three-speed, and I was already doing weekends at the uh, transmitter site because, you know, AM... AM directional stations in particular, they would have multiple towers in swamps because they, they want to have great ground conductivity to get the signal out. Mm-hmm. And this station was, uh, you know, my town at that point was very waspy, but they were covering Harford. So the, mm-hmm. the, their market was the Harford uh, uh, demo. 
And so they would play reggae um, and Calypso stuff and, and just R&B during the week. Mm-hmm. And the weekend's primarily gospel. So I grew up being a gospel DJ on the weekends playing either doing all the live joins from all the gospel churches in Hartford or playing, you know, pre-recorded stuff. Oh, wait, listen, I'm sorry. I, have, I, yeah. I, I, I like people to talk. I don't like to interrupt yeah, them. Yeah. When you say you were playing gospel, you were actually playing the records and talking on the radio? Yeah, I would have to, like, um, I wasn't doing full gospel shows, but if there were breaks between sets and stuff, I would have to, like, do live live breaks Introducing the next church. You know, oh, I see. Oh, I see. Had, like so, radio lines. Oh, I see. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. So it wasn't. Stuff. It wasn't really records. It was. It wasn't, act, yeah. It wasn't, it was, there were like preachers. To, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And okay, Reverend okay, Belcher. Okay. I mean, there were some incredible combos, man. That the, the the bands were great. And of course, it's AM radio, so the quality wasn't super cool, but uh, or super high quality. But imagine like the old bluegrass recordings. We had one microphone, and mm-hmm. you know the players just knew how to gather around. Yeah, the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah. yeah, and these churches knew how to get the max out of what they had to play with. So mm-hmm. they had to have great, great little combos, great players, man. Mm-hmm. Just um, so I, I, I did that for quite a while. But and so meanwhile, I'm riding my bike around. <laughs> so I get a call before I'm going to school, and it was on my way to going to school. It's early because it was a daytime radio station. So they set, they turn out right around sunrise. And uh, hey, uh, can you call, hey, can, there's noise on the air. I think it was the station owner who called me. He goes, can you go check out what's going on? Uh, all I'm hearing is this constant click on the air. So, and I can't reach the guy at the studio. So I'm oh, like, sure. A man. constant click means it's the end of a record. That's yeah, what a well, constant click. Yeah, he didn't, I guess, put two and two together. So I get there. And this is like uh, probably like six six thirty in the morning. I'm, I'm riding my three speed through town and getting there in like five minutes. I get in there and I see John Gary. who was like this. Um, he w- he was a famous DJ in the morning for us, but he also did was a nightclub uh, DJ in New Haven. The night, you know, <laughs> on night. So you know, this guy was burning both ends of the stick. So <laughs> yeah, I see his head next to the you know on the console. All passed out. I'm 13 years old. I see, I see a bunch of white lines, mm-hmm. and I see a razor, <laughs> <laughs> and I see that that turntable, Just... that the end of the old gray. It's called gray. Gray was a manufacturer. The wooden turntable. Mm-hmm. Uh, arm just hitting the, the label of the 45, you know, and right. making that noise on the air. Oh, so, this is the 70s now. Yeah, oh, it was. Oh, man. Okay, so that go. was 75. So I, I'm like, oh shit. So I go play some carts, you know, put some carts in there, start playing those, you know, some commercials or just some IDs or something, get queue up another record and try to rest, rest, get this John alive again, man. So I'm trying to nudge him along and he finally wakes up. And meanwhile, the general manager's just calling the phone. There's no cell phones or any of that shit back then. So he's, he's like, what was it? What was it? And I'm looking at John and I'm like, uh... It was uh, the phono preamp blew up, you know, and it was you, were, you know, I had to swap out the phono preamp, and and John's like, you know, yeah, I was like, this guy just covered for me. I was like, best friends with everybody there from that that time on, man. You know, so it was like <laughs> one good deed. Yeah, it was crazy though. That was like first time I saw cocaine in my life, and you know, I was like, man. Mm. Everyone's got to sleep, John, you know? <laughs> so, well, okay, I, I can stop the story there, but you have some other stories, because you met some pretty famous uh, groups. You even um, you, oh, you, yeah, you, sure, you, you had to deal with Whitney Houston before Whitney no, Houston. No, not Shirley. Mm-hmm. It was uh, Shirley Caesar. Okay. So Shirley, I did sound for uh, Dennis Brown in the West Indian Club, mm-hmm. and I that was pretty amazing. Um, that was in North End of Hartford, but I did at Weaver High School, which... High school my grandmother went to in Hartford. Uh, I was doing sound for Shirley Caesar and who opened up for him? The Mighty Clouds of Joy. Oh, I love so, the Mighty Clouds of Joy. So, you know, and here I, I might have been a little bit older, maybe in the next year, so 14 years old or so. And uh, <laughs> let's just say I, I know why they're called the Mighty Clouds of Joy. But uh, <laughs> ever, ever since on clouds? <laughs> what? <laughs> but but I remember setting up the microphone, and I literally, I was comfortable in, like, you know, being the minority in, in, in these groups, because the people at that station were 
first of all, they were all professional, and they were all trying to make it, and I really respected, you know, people doing stuff with the passion that they did. Mm -hmm. And I also learned early on, like, I'm not going to be a DJ, because these cats, especially, like, commercial DJs, they their lifespans were so limited. Mm -hmm. Only a few got to stay in the same market for long enough. So I was like, mm -hmm. you know what? I'm going to stay on the engineering side. A little, oh, know, okay. a little, okay. little, little more you know, legs uh, there, you know? So <laughs> I remember setting up the microphone and all the all these ladies, are, you know, I had one microphone set up for, for uh, Shirley. And I never saw her. I've heard her records and stuff, but I never saw her physically. And, um, and all these... They're all, maybe I was self conscious because I was like the only white person there or something. But, but they're all like, they're wait, like, wait, I got to ask you a black question. I got to ask yeah, you a black question. Especially with all those, did they say, oh, honey, did they bring you over to put you to, to their bosom? Did they, did, who, did they bust your child? Did they, okay. It was more like, you know, you know, aren't you, you know, what you doing here? You know, you know, you know what you're doing and all that <laughs> stuff. And, uh, and, and everyone's kind of like, it was, it seemed to be, I was, I was missing the inside joke because mm -hmm. I was like so nervous about getting the, this microphone set up correctly, and that, and I was like, man, I wonder how tall she is, I, you know, all that stuff. So I was trying to set it up right before she got on stage, mm -hmm. and they're all kind of giggling and stuff. Turns out, she didn't need no damn microphone. <laughs> I was about to say, Shirley sees a microphone. Yeah, what? Yeah, if I remember, she was, you know, not very tall, and she was substantially. Girthy, I don't know. What she the was word. ample. She we was could, ample. Yeah, that's a great word. And but my God, and I would say even though I had I had cut my teeth on playing all those live churches, not being in the churches per se, mm -hmm. this was my first true gospel experience. So I go, um, I get through that. Um, I think I got the story in the reverse though. I think I went and helped uh, load up uh, for. My, uh, Mighty Clouds of Joy mm -hmm. and before they performed because they opened up for her I think she, okay. she must have been the headliner yeah. Yeah, of course so mm -hmm. I remember going to their truck and partaking in the Mighty Clouds of Joy so I was even more paranoid when I was like setting up that <laughs> microphone for her so, so and then, and then now everything was totally intense you know you can imagine that so it's like why are all these people looking at me? You know? Well, well, hold on. When you say partaking, was it was it a contact partaking, or did you directly partake? I think I'm. I think I was. Uh, I was uh, encouraged to partake. Enc okay, okay. But by, by one of the by one of the uh, by one of the know, mighties. Yeah, and it didn't take much. <laughs> yeah, <believe> so. <laughs> okay, uh, so you had the gospel was, experience. But that actually probably in that totally enlightened. You know, heightened everything yeah, during yeah. that show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I just wanted to hear that story. This is great. Yeah. Do you have a, do you have another kind of story that from from those early days? Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, it's you know it's it's a little boring, but that that particular station made history because, well, first of all, it was the first state. The FCC was trying to encouraging minority ownership in radio stations. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time they used the new law that they passed. Mm -hmm. That basically, the owner of the station was this white dude who basically, you know, um, was trying to run it without spending money, and he mm -hmm. just really just and he and he ran two books, oh. two sets of books, mm -hmm. for, and, and he got eventually he and he was going around. This is all stuff I found out after the fact. He started screwing around um, with the bookkeeper. Mm -hmm who he ended up jilting. Uh, he was in his, uh, she went to his wife, and then you can mm. imagine what happened after that. I got to so, I, I got to ask the racial conversation. So the yeah. bookkeeper was white too? Or the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. That was so, so, so the administration was white and the talent was black. The, the, yeah, yeah. But, but the program director was mm. black. The, the, the music director mm. Um, mm. was um, uh, Melanie McLean, right? Jackie's uh, daughter. So okay. that was cool. So Jackie's presence was kind of there, and, and that's kind of because he was she, she was, was, she was she, super young too. Yeah. She was probably not even not even twenty then, you know. Mm -hmm. So she was pretty young. Of course, Jackie was teaching at the college up there, wasn't he? Yeah, he, yeah. he had a, uh, he had the thing at University of Harford going, but he also had that 
they changed the name. I think it was the Greater Hartford Jazz Collective or something. Mm-hmm. So he had a big thing going on in, in the Hartford area in general. Mm-hmm. So he was well known for, mm-hmm. for doing stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, and none of that was like credit to this owner because he, he was pretty slimy. But anyway, he got nailed for running two books, forced to sell the station. Um, and then a group of, my, uh, a minority group bought it. So it's the first time in the entire country that th- this process actually quote unquote worked. Mm, you know? okay. But the side story about that is it was like a directional radio station, right? So you needed, uh, just like a microphone, you have like a cardioid yeah. pattern yeah. or a figure eight pattern, depending mm. on how your towers are tuned. Uh, and that was my gig to tune the, the towers too. Mm. But um, the guy, I didn't know this when it happened, but I, but basically, my, my friend lived up on, on the hill in the swamp, and he was craw- he, he was trying to get across the swamp with getting, without going, you know, getting too swampy. Mm-hmm. And he, he basically uh, forced the tower to collapse by holding onto the guy wires, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, when I found out, and the owner found out, I'm like, oh, man, they're going to be so pissed off. And the owner's like, best thing ever happened because then he got to run his station as a non-directional station mm. which just meant he had one tower and he can cover Hartford so much better mm. so it was by you know my friend's misfortune mm. that caused the station to be worth more money and mm. sell more ads and all that stuff mm. it was just like man this is crazy shit wow 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 okay so thanks a lot Jake for, for that history man it's great history <laughs>